So those of you who are following along, um, I'm hoping that all of you can load in Phoenix and, and get it started. And then we're gonna run a couple tutorials um, uh, using the Phoenix. And so we'll, we'll start off with a tutorial that optimizes um, map sharpening. And then we'll talk about that. I'll give you a little short lecture on the subject. And so, so suppose you have your Phoenix GUI as I have it demonstrated here. And um, we are going to start a new project. So it's in the upper left corner, it says new project, and then we're gonna open tutorials. So new project that opens a window for us and near the middle bottom, it says set up tutorial data. We're gonna click on that. And then it's gonna give us a choice of what to select for our tutorial. I'm gonna select a data set and then I'm gonna scroll down near the bottom. There's all these cryoEM uh, data sets. And we're gonna to go to the one that's near the bottom it says major capsid protein of rotavirus auto sharpen map. Oops, I unselected. Here, we'll try that again. Auto sharpen map. Okay, so that should show up in your window there. And you can put it in a default place, documents on my computer, or you can put it wherever you want. You can specify that. And I'll just use the default there and hope that works okay. And I can find out that that project is selected by going to the upper left corner of my window and double clicking on last modified. And there's a check mark next to rotavirus auto sharpen. And that means that's the default project at this moment. Something you might not know is if we go just a little bit above that, there's a button here, it says settings. I'm gonna click on that. And in the settings, there's a view readme. So for all the tutorials, there's a readme file that tells you what to do. And actually we're gonna follow these quite closely in these tutorials. And that will be helpful because if I misspeak or if I go too fast, you can look at the readme, which I just opened here. And that will stay open on your window. And you can see the things that we're doing and you can remember what they are um, if I, as I said, if I go too fast. So I'm just gonna leave that up here. And so this is an auto sharpening tutorial. And we already did the first part. We did the new project setup tutorial. We got everything all ready. So let's do the second step, which is looking at the starting map. So um, you can open Coot directly from uh, Phoenix, provided you have Coot installed somewhere. If you don't have Coot, um, well, get it, that's the best thing to do. Um, you can also use um, Pymo, and you can also um, use Chimera to do almost everything as well. So anyways, I'm gonna click on the uh, Coot button, and that should open uh, Coot for me. And it might take a few seconds to open on your computer. It usually doesn't load real fast. Okay, so here's, I've got Coot. Well, it looks like I did it. Looks like I did it twice, three times. Let's do it one more time slowly, once. Just click once and then we'll get our coot. Okay, and now looking at the instructions, um, coot, notice it says connected to Phoenix. So coot and Phoenix are talking. Coot knows about what Phoenix wants. So um, we can, in coot, we can go file open map and we're gonna open the map we want. And Coot is gonna have opened in the right directory. So it will automatically be in the place where our files are located. So we're gonna filter. And here's the map we want. We're gonna take the blurred map. You can use the over sharpen one if you want, it doesn't matter. Um, so we're gonna click on rotavirus blurred map and we're gonna open that. And um, there also is a model in there. Let's load that model. So file, open coordinates. Once again, and filter, sort by date. And once again, it's gonna open in, in the directory where all this, these files are. I didn't mention that when we said set up tutorial data, it made a little directory and put all the files in it. So that's in my documents, rotavirus auto sharpen. Okay, so I open our, my molecule. 
And there it is. And this is just a little piece of rotavirus. It's not a big model, but um, you can look at our map and the map doesn't look all that great. Um, the map looks pretty low resolution. Now it happens that in fact, <clears throat> this map contains high resolution data. We've just blurred it. So we have the wrong sharpening in this map. And in this little tutorial that we're about to do, we're gonna undo that. So it's a little bit amazing though, that this map looks like it's only low resolution, but actually it contains high resolution information. It's just suppressed. Okay, so let's, we'll just move that off to the side. Uh, let's move it to this side. And then we're gonna do auto sharpening. So we're just gonna go down our instructions, run auto sharpening. So we're gonna go to the GUI. Where's my GUI? So that's not a GUI. Here's my GUI. And um, so it still knows that we're working on the rotavirus project. And in the main Phoenix window, this is what it looks like to start off with. We're gonna go to Crow EM, and then we're gonna go to auto sharpen map. So we just can click on that. And it opens a typical Phoenix GUI window, which asks us for a title, data, maybe some parameters, and then go. So let's put in a job title. Actually, in our instructions, it even has a title for us. So we can just paste that right in. So I'll paste that in there. So I don't even have to type it. And, uh, but do, do put in a title. Why are you putting in the title? You're putting in the title, not for now. You're putting it because two weeks from now, you'll have run 56 runs and you won't possibly remember which one is which unless you type something in that title that tells you what's different about this one than all the other runs. So just put something that's informative in job title. Okay, so we need for this auto sharpening, we're gonna need um, a map file. And in this case, we're gonna do it just with the map by itself. If you have a model, you can put that in too, and that can help. But we're just gonna use the map all by itself. So we clicked on that and our, we're gonna click on blurred map. So we load that in and we need to tell it more or less the resolution. Um, this is the resolution you would have obtained when you did your data processing and it's the gold standard resolution. And in this case, let's just say 2.7. It doesn't matter hugely, um, but getting it about right helps. And in this case, that's all we have to tell it. So let's just run. And when you hit the button run, then it starts working. If you don't like what you did, you can hit abort and that will stop it. And usually that stops it right away. Uh, might take a minute or two sometimes. So what's it doing? It's reading in the map and then it's gonna look at that map and it's gonna ask, how can I modify this map by accentuated or de-accentuating high resolution information such that the map looks clearer and we'll see a little bit more theory in a second so it did that and that was pretty quick um, and now we can um, open this map we can we could double click on it uh, we could hit open in coot another way to get to the same map is in coot itself um, we can open it and we can open map and it once again opens to the same directory now there's a subdirectory called auto sharpen let's go in there and there's our sharpen map.ccp4. And by the way, CCP4 maps, MRC maps, they're pretty much the same thing. So you there in Phoenix reads them and writes both of them. So we can double click on that and it just loaded in our map. Um, you can't see it too well because they're the same color. So let me turn off the blurred map and let me just change the properties of the new map to make it a little bit easier to see. And there we go. And um, another little trick in Coot, um, for cryo EM maps, very often the default level isn't what you want. Um, and the, the default step for when you scroll might be a little small. So I typically um, set the level pretty high, like 20 RMSDs in step of one. In this particular case, it's not perfect, but we'll use that later. And um, okay, so there's our map. 
and um, it looks a lot different, right? So now it looks like a 2.7 angstrom map. And once again, this is the same map that we saw before. It's just, so that's what we had, and this is what we have now. It's just been accentuating the high resolution information. So let's now go to um, a presentation for a minute or two and think about how we got that. And also we'll talk about other things we can do um, for map optimization. Okay, so let me make this a little bit bigger. And there we go. And so cryo EM map improvement. And um, this is a collaboration with lots of people, um, including some outside the Phoenix Consortium. So here's the big picture that different version of what Paul showed before um, of the kind of things in cryo EM you can do now in Phoenix. You got your starting map on the left. Um, you can improve the map. We'll talk about that now. Um, you can figure out the symmetry of the map. We'll do that a little bit later. Um, you can manipulate map. You can cut out pieces of map. You can box around a molecule. You can extract the unique part of a map if it has symmetry. Um, you can dock and model build. We'll do that a little bit later today. Uh, you can refine using the map in a model. You can validate, and you'll hear about that, those two next week. So right now, let's, we're going to focus on map improvement. And we're going to do three, talk about three things in this context. Um, one's going to be the map sharpening that we just demoed. Um, the next one um, is density modification. And that was a little more sophisticated version of ways to improve a map. And then we'll talk about combining focused maps. So let's talk about the um, automatic map sharpening. So this picture shows, in fact, the same map we were just looking at, at varying sharpening levels. So basically, for crystallographers, we're adding or subtracting an overall Wilson B to the, um, to the map Fourier coefficients. Or you can think of it um, as accentuating or de-accentuating the high resolution information. And it settled on this version of sharpness. And um, how did it decide that that's a good amount of sharpening? Um, and the th several things that it's using, the basic idea is to try to maximize the level of detail um, and at the same time, maximize the connectivity of the map. So, the map that we, the version we're looking at right here, um, does show a lot of detail and it has high connectivity. The way this is done in practice is to basically count the number of separate blobs of density at a particular contour level, and that tells you about connectivity, and also to count to look at the surface area, which becomes higher the more detail that's shown. So we try to maximize the detail and also maximize the connectivity or minimize the number of different blobs in the map. And that automatically gives us um, improved maps and it works pretty well. Generally speaking, this procedure gives you pretty much the sharpening that you would like to see. And the nice feature is it's done automatically. You don't have to test everything. And um, here are a couple examples. We, we just saw one, of course, Here's a deposited structure that was deposited without sharpening and then automatically run it with <clears throat> auto sharpen. It's very nicely sharp. There's another one that's not fully sharpened when it's deposited and it's also uh, produced nicely. So basically you can run this, this software automatically and it gives you, generally speaking, a pretty good um, answer as to um, how sharp your map ought to be. As I said, there's lots of additional details you can um, apply with this procedure. You can add a model that can make it um, more sensitive. Um, if you use, you can use two half maps to sharpen the map. Um, we have additional procedures that called um, local anisotropic sharpening that will sharpen your map differentially um, in different Fourier directions as well. Okay, so 
now let's try, let's talk about another kind of procedure. Um, and that's a way to actually change the information content in your map. And so the, the auto sharpening procedure, all it did was accentuate or deaccentuate high resolution information. That's it. And it just did that in a reasonable way that makes your map look nice. Okay, so density modification does more than that. Density modification can, in fact, yeah, change the accentuation of high resolution information, but it also changes what happens at every resolution. So it changes the phases and amplitudes in your map. And you might think, well, yeah, they use that in crystallography, um, but why should that work in cryo-EM? Well, here's, here's a picture of um, cryo-EM and X-ray maps. And Paul showed another one earlier that um, kind of illustrates that in fact, X-ray maps and cryo-EM maps, they look really similar. So here's GROW-EL X-ray map. Here's GROW-EL cryo-EM map. And you know, it's, it's kind of astonishing. These maps, they're almost the same which means they're both looking at the same thing. You know, there's a slight conformational change between what was looked at in this crystal structure and this particular cryo map, but these maps look really, really similar. And there's some subtle details about some of the side chains, of course. Okay, so the maps have very similar properties. Maybe you, ought to, maybe you could do the same kind of thing. So um, this, this picture just illustrates that the parallels between cryo-EM and X-ray. So in the upper part in cryo-EM, the Fourier transform in, of an image, of one single image, one of these pictures, is a section through the Fourier transform of the structure. In crystallography, one diffraction pattern is basically also a section through the Fourier transform of the structure. Um, turns out you only get the amplitudes in X-ray, you get the amplitudes in phases in cryo-EM. So the reconstruction procedures in X-ray and cryo-EM are basically combining the sections of Fourier transforms, doing inverse Fourier transform to get a picture. In X-ray, you don't get the amplitude, the phases automatically, and you have to have a tricks to do that. In cryo-EM, of course, you get the phases, but they're not perfect. So, um, so what are you gonna do? And so here's the trick that works for both X-ray and cryo-EM. And it's not as dramatic for cryo-EM, but it does help. And we're gonna see an example in a moment about how to, how to actually do that. So here's the trick. Um, you're gonna use some, what you expect, prior knowledge about what one part of the map ought to look like and we're going to use that expectation to improve some other part of the map. So these di this difference between using information in one place to improve another place, that's the key thing. And the reason this is going to work is because it's a Fourier transform. So on the left, here's our original map. It's got noise in the solvent, and our protein doesn't look quite right. And um, we're going to say, oh, I know where the solvent is, it's over here on the left. And then we're gonna say, I think the solvent should be flat. Or a different way of saying that is, I think the solvent really is flat. And the reason it's not flat in my picture is because my picture is a little bit wrong and I have a little bit, some errors in my Fourier transform, in my Fourier coefficients. So another thing you might say is, this is a little more subtle. I think I know what the distribution of density values should be in the protein region, and it should match those of a typical protein. And we won't go into detail about these density values, but what I'm trying to say is that there are some points that have very high density, like our protein molecule, and in between them, there's points that have low density. And and it's kind of sharp between the two. And if you look in the solvent, of course, that's very different. That distribution is just kind of a Gaussian. So putting these two, these pieces of information together, 
we're going to get a density modified map. Now let's look at this in just a little more detail. So our maps are calculated from Fourier terms. So we have a sum of Fourier terms that lead to our map. And the thing about the Fourier transform is that if we change one Fourier term, that affects all the points in the map. So if we had a perfect picture and we changed one component Fourier term, the whole map gets a ripple in it, gets there's a mistake. So that means that an error in one term, one Fourier term, one coefficient, leads to correlated errors throughout the map. And that's really important. So one Fourier term is wrong. It makes errors everywhere in the map. And then turning that around, we can say, let's fix a particular Fourier term based on looking at one part of the map that can improve another part of the map so in the picture if we fix this little bump here that's in our solvent that's going to fix the protein region too so this in pink is the key thing for density modification so Fourier terms that improve the map in one place improve it everywhere so the way you actually do this one Fourier term at a time, you find the value that yields the most plausible map fixing all the other Fourier terms. And then the new Fourier terms improve the whole map. And we call that map phasing. You don't have to worry about that. Here's the, here's the whole procedure. We're gonna start with two half maps. So half maps being maps created with half the data, the maps are in the same orientation, the maps look very similar to each other, but they have more or less random errors that are different between the two. So we're gonna take our two half maps, we're gonna sharpen each one using auto sharpen or another similar way, and we're gonna average them to make one full map. So full map means map using all the data. Then we're gonna take that full map. We're gonna identify where the protein is or macromolecule and where the solvent is. And then we are going to um, generate target histograms, what we expect for the distribution of densities for the macromolecule and the solvent. Then, so that's done in real space in the, using the maps. Now we're gonna to move to reciprocal space, Fourier space. So we'll cal cal calculate a Fourier transform of the maps. So we have Fourier terms for two origin original half maps. So one set of Fourier terms for each half map. With these Fourier terms, we're gonna do the procedure I just described about map phasing in order to improve the quality of the map coefficients based on what we expect the solvent to be flat and the protein to have distributions like those of proteins or whatever the macromolecule is. So in Fourier space, we get map phasing estimates of Fourier terms. And there's one of those for each half map. And that uses the information from these target histograms that we made. So now we're gonna, and then, so now we have our original Fourier terms and we have map phasing estimates that are different and improved. And the map phasing estimates, it turns out, this is a subtlety, but it's actually very important. These map phasing estimates of the Fourier terms are, have independent errors, more or less, compared to the original errors in the original map. That means you can then combine these two, calculating the weighted average of information from the original Fourier terms, and from the map phasing estimates. It's a little bit trickier um, in cryo-EM than in crystallography, because in fact, there are some correlations between these two and we have to take them into account. And when we do it in a moment, I'll try to mention that. 
And then now we have weighted average map. We can just do the Fourier transform generated density modified map. When you're doing density modification, here's some things to think about. Um, you might get improvement in resolution in the range of 0.05 to 0.3 angstroms for a typical map. For lower resolution maps, if you're in the four to five, six angstrom range, sometimes you get a lot, a dramatic improvement, one angstrom resolution improvement, but usually it's small. And the example we're gonna see in a moment is small. It works best with half maps that have uniform noise. That is maps that are not masked, um, maps that have the least processing that can give a good map um, available. And um, we're gonna do the tutorial that are supplied with, the, with Phoenix, of course. So let's do that now. So now we're gonna jump back to our Phoenix and we're gonna do some density modification. If there's, if anybody has any questions at this point, great time to raise your hand and then Paul will stop me or Nigel will stop me um, if, uh, if you have questions at this point. So I'm gonna close these windows that I was working on and then we are going to open a new tutorial. Okay, so let's do that. Oh, let me get rid of that box. Okay, so let's open a new tutorial and we're gonna do a tutorial that includes density modification, model building. We're gonna do the model building a little later. So I hit new project, set up tutorial data, select a data set, I scroll down. And this time we're gonna do human apoferritin density modification, model building and refinement at 1.8 angstrom. So we can click on that and then um, we can hit okay and it should set up that project. And if I double click on last modified, there it is. And once again, I'm gonna hit settings and read me um, so that we have our instructions right there. I can close that window, okay. So, um, so this example takes um, data from uh, apoferritin cryo -EM map. Apoferritin has um, quite high symmetry um, that actually doesn't play a role in density modification. The density modification is done uh, pretty much identically if you have symmetry and if you don't have symmetry. So you leave the symmetry in when you do the density modification. Um, doing density modification on just a part of it does not help. So you just take the whole box that contains your whole molecule with, in this case, all 24 copies, and it's fine. So the data that we have um, are two half maps, um, a sequence file, and the sequence file tells us kind of how big the molecule is. And um, there's also a an auto sharpened version of the map that um, we can just use for comparison. So I'm gonna scroll down here just a little bit. Um, so we already did the setup tutorial data. So let's examine the starting map just so we can see what we've got. So we're gonna do, so we already selected our project. So that's gonna open in the right directory. We can open code. If you already had it open, that's fine. You can just continue or, or close the windows that were there. So in Coot, we can gonna, gonna go open map and it'll take us right to the right place. And let's open the auto sharpen map. So this is basically the best you could get with what was already there. So we can open that. Coot takes a minute or two to, or not a minute, but a few seconds to open this. We're also gonna load in a model. Let me just get those now. So open coordinates, filter, sort by date. And then this is um, the deposited, actually, no, this is not. This is a um, docked structure of apoferritin from a crystal structure, one chain that's been docked in real space refined. 
So anyways, it's in kind of the right place. And um, it's not where I want it to be, so I can go this little baton here in Coot. I can click that, chain A, five, three, and click on anything and apply, and it'll jump to the right place. Okay, so here's our molecule. And then, oh, there's this other problem that I mentioned before about um, Coot doesn't necessarily get the contours the way you want. Um, so I'm going to go to Display Manager. And then this is the map we're looking at, Properties. And um, actually, let me change the color while I'm at it to make it a little easier to see. Okay, there's our color. And then it's set level. And you can put in like 50 or something for this map, whatever, 40. RMSD and change by one or two. And then um, apply and OK, close you out. And um, looks like I set that contour a little bit high, but should um, generate the contour easily enough. So now my mouse works kind of the way I want it to. So I can see this map reasonably well. And actually, I'm going to just turn it so we see these um, two phenylalanines. That's because this came from a crystal structure, and the crystal structure had two alternate conformations of this phenylalanine. Um, but what we're going to see now is Okay, so the map doesn't look that great. This is the starting map, but you can see that, um, yeah, one of these confirmations is going to be the right one. And um, so now we're going to do density modification on this map, and we're going to see if it can improve it a little bit. So that's going to be the goal. Next, this takes about 10 minutes to do this one. So back to our Phoenix instructions, um, we're going to run density modification. So we're going to go to the Phoenix GUI. In our Phoenix GUI under CryoEM, um, we're going to go down to Resolve CryoEM. That's density modification. We can click it once, and it'll open our standard GUI here, window here. And it gives us a little bit of instructions on the top if you want to read them. So density modification of CryoEM maps, and the basic inputs are two half maps, not masked, resolution, and a sequence file. And if you supply a map that's trimmed, and we did in this um, case, um, you turn off box before analysis. So basically, if you supply a map that has a huge map and a teeny little molecule in the middle of it, then you do want to box it before analysis. And basically, when you run Resolve CryoEM, first just go with all defaults. And then if you don't like what you get, um, here's some suggestions about other things you might want to try. And I'll be happy to answer questions later on those other options. Okay, so let's put in our title. Once again, I'm just going to paste that right in here. April Ferritin tutorial. And um, so now we need two half maps. So you always need half maps. I'm going to browse. And there's half maps. Map one, and I load it in, and another half map. There's the other one. And um, you can leave the resolution blank if you want, but um, normally put in here the resolution that you got from your um, gold standard. In this particular case, I'm going to do 2.2 um, angstroms because I know it's going to work well. And then resolution for density modification does not have to be the same as the overall resolution. In this case, we'll do that at the full resolution of the map, which is 1.8 angstroms. And you would not necessarily know what the best, absolute best numbers for these are in advance. And so a little bit of trying different ones is fine. Um, you'll get pretty much the same answer with any number that's kind of similar to 1.8, 2.2. We'll all give you a very similar maps, um, but they will be a little bit different. And so it's fine to run it more than once and choose the one that you like the best. Our sequence file to tell us how big the molecule is. And uh, seek.dat has all the copies here. So it'll tell us, it'll tell it how many there are. You could put the seek unique and put in 24 copies and give you the same answer. You could also tell it the molecular mass or the solvent content, the fraction of the box that is empty. 
of, of, of macromolecule. And we decided we're not going to box before analysis because this particular map that we're working with has already been boxed. So it's been cut down. All right, let's see what else we want to do. So we did the resolution, resolution for density modification, sequence file, box before analysis is false, number of processors. Um, this doesn't affect things as much as you might like. Um, the default is um, to use multiple processors in some of the steps, but not other ones, just because um, the swapping on most computers slows things down so much that it doesn't help using more processors. So anyways, I have a Mac with eight processors, I'll use four, it should be fine. Um, also, just to make this particular structure work the best, um, density modify unsharpened maps, we're gonna set that as true. Where is that? Density my, modify unsharpened maps. So the minus sign means it's default, whatever the program wants. Um, check means yes, no, empty means no. So uh, we want it to, yes. So we want it to be true, so we check it, yes. And um, do we want a final scale um, with FSC ref? Um, and we wanted that to be um, false. So these are just a couple options. Um, if you hover over um, a keyword here, it tells you what it is. So density modifier unsharpened maps, it says use un unsharpened, that is original half maps in the density modification procedure. Um, sometimes, so this is basically when you do the, um, get the map phasing that I, we talked about, that's a real space procedure. So whatever map you put in there, that's the map that's used. And if you accentuate the high resolution, you get a different answer than if you don't. And um, so usually in most cases, um, sharp, auto sharpening the map first works the best. That's why this, that's the default. In this particular case, auto sharpening doesn't work as well as using the original maps. And then this final scale with FSC ref, um, that, uh, that's a procedure that does a final resolution dependent scaling um, that tries to optimize um, the final map and the procedure often works. In this particular case, it doesn't work that well, so we're not gonna do it. So this is another thing you can do, try it with, without. And basically the way we set things up here are, we have options for things that you might wanna change, and we tend to put those on the front page. The defaults are what generally works the best, but it's not possible for us to always get all the defaults perfect. So that's why we leave some options on the front page for you to change. And we try to give you instructions about what to do. In these cases, you can just run with, without, um, may or may not improve. Okay. Um, and what else do we want to do? Resolution bins. Oh, we're going to change this one just because it just speed it up a little bit. So default number of bins and resolutions is 100. We'll use 20. That'll just be a little quicker. You can do multiple cycles of density modification if you want. Sometimes that makes it a lot better. Usually it makes it a little bit better. You have lots of other options that you can change if you wish. Um, in particular, you can densely modify um, by automatic generation of multiple models. So basically this means it's gonna do density modification and then it's gonna generate an ensemble of models based on those, that, those maps. So it's gonna build models for you automatically. And then it's gonna use those models to improve, to in density modification to improve the map. You can also supply a model file, in which case it will randomize that model by rebuilding, uh, shaking and, uh, by shaking and refinement, um, and then use that model information in density modification. That works pretty well too. And there's, we don't have any evidence that there is any model bias, but you do have to, always be careful that to check and make sure that it's not biasing your map. But we have, we have no evidence that it is a problem. Okay, so in any case, the normal way is two half maps, just like we're doing. And I think we got everything done. And now, 
or just a couple of things at the bottom here. If you want, um, you can restore the full size of your map. So if it box, if you did box your map before analysis, then it cuts out a little piece. If you want to restore it to the full size, you can check that. You can also resample your map on a fine grid if you wish to do so. Um, if you resample, um, then you do have to have the grid has to start at zero. So you can't just arbitrarily resample on anywhere. Okay, so we're all set. And I'm just going to run and run now. And <clears throat> should do something. And as it tells us what's going on. So as in almost all these things, it's going to read in the files, make sure everything is what it's supposed to look like. And just at the top here, just let me point out a couple things. So typically in Phoenix, um, what the GUI does is the GUI writes out a little file that has all the information about what you want to do. And so here's some of that information that came from that file was tells it what the input files are, what the name of our half maps are, the name of the sequence uh, sequence file is, and then parameters we put in, 2.2 angstroms, box before analysis is false, bins 20, resolution 1.8, um, some strategy things that we typed in there, number of processors, our title. So this is this little this is little file was read written by the GUI and then the program really when it really runs it reads this little file and does what it's supposed to do which is totally equivalent to as Paul mentioned um, running from the command line so the GUI sets up the right files to run from the command line and then the GUI runs in the background in command line and it's not going to use any models and um, so it's a, we, we checked off quick run, I didn't mention that. And based on that, it set a few more parameters for us. And you might just notice a few things about your map, just in case um, you put in the wrong map or something, it tells you about where the origin was and it's shifted to zero, zero, zero for analysis. So this map was boxed previously. Okay, and um, so then it, it, it converts the maps to structure factors like we talked about and is doing that at um, 1.8 angstroms and so now it's going to um, actually do the things that we have been uh, talking about and um, let me just stop there for a moment while it's doing that and if anybody has any questions that we haven't answered let's see so uh, yes Tom there's there's a few questions. The um, so the first question is: At what level of confidence with the model use uh, with the model using the model along map helps with auto sharpening? Yeah, that's a great question. To which I do not have an exact answer. Um, basically, if you have a model that's a good model and has a correlation with your map, you know, 0.7, that kind of number. Um, it, or more, that's going to help. If you have a model that's pretty bad and its correlation with the map is like 0.5 or less, it's not going to help. And in between there, you know, you can give it a try. It, the model will rarely make it worse um, unless the model is very bad. So it's a, it's a fine thing to try. Using the model or not, if you have a pretty poor model, it's going to be a matter of... Um, inspection yourself so you run it without the model run it with the model you know, it only takes a minute or two and then you can just look at the maps and see which one shows is more clear okay um another question uh, how does phoenix auto sharpen results compare with coots sharpening blurring tool so they're actually very different um so coots tool for sharpening is a slider, more or less, that allows you to um, just apply a Wilson B uh, to a map. So first off, you have to have um, Fourier coefficients. You have to have an empty Z file for Coot. You can't do it with um, just a regular, just map. So you have to convert it to Fourier coefficients. And then Coot will just add or subtract an overall sharpening factor. So 
auto sharpen um, adds does that, but in addition, um, it has more or less a high resolution cutoff. It's a it's not a cutoff. It's a smooth decrease. Um, but the key is that suppose you sharpen a map um, in Coot, it's going to sharpen, and you have high very high resolution data present. If you sharpen a map, eventually that very high resolution data is going to totally dominate, and it will just be really noisy. Um, but with auto sharpen, you can tell it the resolution that you give it tells it that if you say the resolution is three, that means that beyond about three angstroms, um, you don't want to use too much of the data. So basically, if you sharpen a map a lot and its resolution is, and you specify the resolution is three, beyond three angstroms, even if there's data there, it won't get accentuated. So you get, it gets sharpened at all resolutions lower than lower resolution than three so three four five those all get sharpened but the two angstrom data in a three angstrom map doesn't get sharpened and that makes a huge difference okay um one more question it looks a little bit complicated um regarding the variable rmsds in different cryoem maps how does one compare between two independent maps based on map rmsd or it's based on common sense to get the sigma best enough to see the side chains. Um, Asok, you might want to clarify if Tom can understand. So let me try first, and then um, Asok, you can ask the question, a follow-up question, perhaps. So, so the key, the key in this question is that cryoia maps have variable resolution in different places in the map. And this really is pretty different than in um, crystallography, where, yeah, your map might have some regions that are disordered, um, but it's not so common to have a whole region of the map be low resolution and a region to be high resolution. You know, it does happen, but it's, it's but in cryo EM it happens all the time. So, um, is there so the question really relates to? Is there kind of one way, one thing you can do so you can have a whole map that is best everywhere in the map? I think that's really the key. And um, the answer is, it's hard to do that. But there are a number of things you can do to try to obtain a single map that has optimal clarity in different parts of the map. Um, so here are some things you can, you can do. One is in AutoSharpen, and um, even better in the local anisotropic sharpening, you can spe specify local sharpening. And then it will try to optimize the map in each local region so as to be best for viewing in that local region. And then it will smooth the, the scaling factors that's used so that the whole map um, is, doesn't have sharp discontinuities anywhere. So this allows you um, to have regions in the map that are sharper, lower and higher resolution, and more or less optimally sharpened within each region. Doing that gives you a very similar result to what you would get if you boxed the map into little pieces and you ran auto sharpening, normal auto sharpening on each of those boxes. So it's hard to beat um, if you just if you're interested in like this helix, it's hard to beat. Cut out the helix with map box, um, and do auto sharpening on that little teeny box map. Um, that's about as good as you're going to get. And you can do that with half maps. You can do that with a full map. You can do it with a model or without a model. So, um, so, so the two answers to the questions really are one: use local sharpening to try to get different values in different places. The other one is um, cut the map up yourself and generate maps that are optimal in each region separately. One last, a third option for you is um, suppose you have a model that's reasonably good and you have a map that has two regions in it and one region in the map um, is, is a high resolution region and one is a low resolution region. 
So you can um, auto sharpen the map using the model. Um, and you can use the model for just the region that's high resolution all by itself. And you can sharpen the map. And now that map is going to be optimally sharpened for the high resolution region. And then you can make another map, take the same map, and then auto sharpen it using the model only for the low resolution region. And now the whole map will be optimized for the low resolution region. So now you have two maps, one that looks good for the high resolution region, one looks good for the low resolution region. And you can put those together with combined focus maps that we're gonna do in just a minute. And then you can um, put together um, the best parts of each, and then you have a combined map, composite map that um, hopefully is, will do what you want. Yeah, okay, that's it at this time. Okay, um, so let's go back to our screen here and just look at what we're, what's going on. Um, the things that we've done, okay, so, oh, I know what's happening. My, my computer is very slow because um, Zoom is using all of my CPU. So anyways, um, so it's a little bit slower than usual. So anyways, um, what we did, um, we identified um, where the protein and solvent were. Um, and the way we, that worked was the, region, the place in the map where everything is happening, where all the, all the density goes up and down all over the place, that's where the protein is. And where there's just the noise, that's where the solvent is. And we know kind of how big that region is supposed to be based on the sequence file that we got. Um, and so then um, we identify um, where the protein is, and then we add a buffer around that to get the approximate solvent content of 73% in this, in this case. And actually the solvent content um, is a relevant number here um, because when you're doing density modification with this particular procedure, it works best when that solvent content is something like more than 50%, less than 95%, that kind of range. So if you have a huge box and a teeny little molecule, it doesn't work that well. So that's why we box it. Okay, so then, so it, it, we boxed it. And let me scroll down here a little bit. And then the next thing we um, sharpened the half maps. And um, in this procedure, uh, so basically we're getting, doing a Fourier shell co correlation between our two half maps. And you know, let me click view log so it won't move on me. And the way these, this is how you um, do sharpening with half maps. It's the same, same kind of procedure. This, this little table shows us resolution seven down to 1.8 in the half map Fourier shell correlation. So this is the correlation between the two half maps using only data at a particular resolution. So at low resolution, the correlation is very high saying that the two half maps look just the same at that resolution. Um, at very high resolution, they're hardly correlated at all. And um, it's possible to estimate, given this correlation between two half maps, uh, assuming random errors, it's possible to calculate from that number, let's say 0.7, um, an estimate of the true correlation between the average of the half maps and the true answer, which we don't know, um, which is going to be higher than this correlation between them, in this case, 0.9 at 2.1 angstrom. And the resolution where this goes down to 0.5, which is going to, looks like it's around 1.95, that's the nominal gold standard resolution of this map. So notice that the correlation between the two half maps at this resolution is much lower than half. It's actually 0.143, that's the magic number, leads to an estimated correlation with the true answer of the average half maps of 0.5. Okay, so that's fine. Um, now the next thing that's happening is we're running density modification um, on each of the individual um, half maps. 
and this density modification procedure is just what we talked about a moment ago. That's where, let me pull that one up. That's this step where we're gonna try to figure out one Fourier term at a time, find the value that makes the most plausible map, fixing all the other terms. And that's the, the map phasing step. So we're gonna do this on one half map, and we're gonna do that on the other half map, and then we're gonna put together the results from those two to, to, to generate our new, uh, new density modified map. And since this is going much slower than usual, let me just see how slow it is going. All right, well, with luck, maybe a couple more minutes. So we're gonna go, so while that's finishing, unless there's any other questions, anything else, Nigel? We're gonna go. Uh, no, but Asok said that you did answer his question. So that was good. Oh, good, okay, I'm glad. Okay, so let's let, we're gonna let this finish. And while we're gonna do that, we're gonna talk about the next thing, which I already referred to. Okay, so this was, this is a procedure uh, again for optimizing the quality of a map. And the idea here is, let's suppose you have more than one map um, for the same structure. And one part of one map is good and a different part of another map is good. And um, maybe a third map has something in between. And we'd like to put all these together um, and make a single map that looks as clear as possible. And we're gonna also allow that there might be conformational differences between um, the structures in the different maps that we're looking at. And we wanna take that into account as well. So we have a procedure for doing that and it's called combined focus maps. And this procedure, as I mentioned a moment ago, you could use it also if you sharpen one map, if you had the same map and you sharpen optimally for one part of the map first and then a made a second map where it's optimally sharpened for a different part of the map. And you can combine those using this exact same procedure. So um, the basic idea is going to be, suppose we have um, a starting map that's up on top here, and it has, let's say, two chains, A and B. And you might not be able to see it too clearly, but chain A is pretty good in this map, and chain B is just a blob. And then maybe we did a focused refinement of our structure and generated another second map B in which chain B is very clear. Um, and maybe the orientation of this chain B is a little bit different than the orientation in A, but in, and also in B, um, chain A doesn't look very good. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use a model or a model for each chain to, to get the relative orientation and placement of each chain. So we're gonna put a model into A and refine it, uh, rigid body. And we're gonna take that same model and put it over here and rigid body it, refine it. And then we're gonna put a model into B and rigid body refine it and take the same model and put it into the other map and rigid body refine it. So now the location and orientation of the refined model of B relative to its location in A tells us how we wanna map the density from B onto A, similarly over here. So then the idea is we get those rotations and translations, um, and then we're gonna average this, the density from the different maps, and we're gonna weight the information from each map based on the map model correlation for that map. So, um, map, this target map has a pretty bad correlation to chain B model. So that won't get much weight. This one has a high correlation to chain B model that will get a lot of weight. Over here, it's the other way around. So when we combine the whole thing, it will look like 
the final map will look like A um, and the good B. And so here's the result of doing exactly that, which um, I think we will uh, skip actually doing, um, or maybe we will, we'll see in a second. So this is the result of actually doing that. Let me just make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. So here's our two maps um, and the refined change that go in them. And then here's the composite map that you get from that that has the good part of A and the good part of B in the same map. So you can use this procedure uh, to generate a composite map. You can then refine your whole model against this composite map if you wish to do so. So that's that's generally what you how you how you would use this procedure. There's some extra features of this that may be useful. Um, you can average entire chains. That is to say, have one weight that goes applied to the entire chain, or you can weight locally so that it smoothly varies in position. You can also apply symmetry to the final focus map. For example, um, you can superimpose chain B in the focus map on four different chains that it's related to in the target map. So you can extrapolate information from one chain here into four symmetry related chains in your target if that happens. And you can also um, apply all the factors that are applied to each of these maps to half maps if you want. So you can supply the full map, which I've shown here, and then you can supply half maps. And then it will carry out the whole procedure on, this, on the half maps using whatever numbers it got from the full maps. And then you end up with a composite pair of half maps that you can then use for your, all your validation things that you would normally use the half maps for. So you can get the local resolution of the composite map. Um, you can estimate the errors in it, all those sorts of things. And let's come back to our, um, okay. So now, now what we did since we last looked here in density modification, So we, gen we ran, we ran um, optimizing the map phasing for each of the half maps. And, and then, and in the process of doing that, um, this is just like in crystallography, you get an, an R value for density modification and the low number is good and 0.24 is a very good number. 0.5 is not a good number, 0.4 is median. So this, Density modification will work pretty well is what I'm saying. And then the last thing is we need to combine the information from the original two half maps and the two density modified half maps. And this table shows as a function of resolution how all that worked. Basically, this table says, under our smooth FSC analysis, it says as a function of resolution, it tells us how good the half map FSC was between the two original half maps, that's what we already saw, and then between the two density modified half maps. And notice it's a little higher. So let's just look here at 2.1 angstroms. The um, half map FSC for the original maps was 0.7, and the half map FSC for the density modified two half maps independently density modified is 0.84. So that's better. Um, and there's a couple of other cross the Fourier shell correlations between the original and the density modified. And then um, error estimates estimated from those things. And then it takes all that information and generates its optimal map. So now mine's finally done. Oops, we don't want that one. We want this. No, yeah, one. Um, there we go. Okay, so now it summarizes the results, which are um, we densely modified at 1.8 angstroms. The starting resolution of the map was 1.93. The final resolution 1.90. So just a little bit different. Um, as you see, it looks a little bit better. 
gives us a plot of the Fourier shell correlation um, for the original half maps. So as a function of resolution or one over resolution, resolution up here um, falls to 0.143 at a little less than two angstroms. And then um, FSC ref means estimated correlation to the true answer. So FSC means correlation between two half maps. FSC ref is the calculated value um, obtained from this FSC. And FSC ref after density modification is calculated from all the correlations that I mentioned before. So that plot shows us in brown the estimated correlation between um, final full map um, in brown um, with the true answer that we don't know. Um, and then in blue after density modification. So a slight improvement in um, resolution. So now let's look at the result. So we can go back to our coot window, which is going to be here somewhere. Um, that's going to be under X quartz. Here's my coot window that we had before. So that's, that's our original. This is our full map, averaged full map. Um, and now we're going to look at our density modified version of the same thing going to open the map um, and it's going to be in our resolve cryoEM directory and show it there we go and our maps are there density modified map so den mod map that's ccd4 that's the one we want and okay and then once again we're going to have to do the thing with setting the contours so I think that did it. Did it do it? Yeah, it's trying to trying to load. There we go. And we're gonna set our properties again. Okay. And all right, so we set our contours about the same as we had before. And let me change our color so we can see it. We'll make this red. Make it yellow. Okay. There we go. Okay. And get rid of the other one. So it's cleaned up a little bit. And um, so this map looks a little bit nicer. It has some things that you couldn't see before, like this, like that particular side chain. There's a few others that you can see now you couldn't see before. Um, mostly it's just cleaned up and just a little bit better map than you had um, previously. The fact that the solvent is flat, that isn't telling you anything because we use that information. But the fact that things are cleaner, um, look, things are more round, things look more like solvent molecules um, afterwards, that's real because we didn't put that information in. So that's actually an improvement in, in the map. And okay, yeah, so we're, we're right on time here. So we're gonna pause now. Um, if there's some more, any more questions before we go on, um, I can take them now or else we'll take, I think, five minute break and then we'll come back to um, model building.